Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to this week's study. Now, as we proceed to finish off this portion of the document and segue into other portions of his presentations, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for direction and guidance so that we may more clearly understand what this author is presenting and may find within what we have studied points about <clears throat> this portion of the book of Daniel so that we might more clearly understand our position today. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance now? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these opportunities to study with other like-minded believers. We thank you that we may be able to come together, though separated in distance, that we are able through technology to come before you. <laughs> Help us now. Guide us, direct us, be with us, so that all that is done may be according to your will. Forgive us of our sins. You know our situations, Father. You know the struggles that we are all facing. We lay these before you and ask now, as we open this author's position and we open your word that we might more properly divide the word of truth. Thank you for this time. Be with us, we pray. May your spirit open our minds and your angels protect us. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, recommended as it was yesterday. We will be looking at the balance of the documents that this author has has placed online. To give you a background, this is a friend of mine. I have known him for over 50 years. The point that he has had within the movement, when Up Columbia Conference <clears throat> made the choice in their words, to clean up the mess in Newport, Washington. There were five members of the Newport Church that were cast out of the church because of their presentations on the charts, because of their belief and their understanding of the seven times of Leviticus 26, and the point <clears throat> that was made very clear that they would not agree to that they would not speak of the seven times of Leviticus 26 in the church, on the church property, or in their homes. Now, this is something that, that I do have the documentation to confirm. Of the five people that were cast out, and there were many others that were censured, that were no longer allowed to speak within the church, but of, of the five that were cast out, two have made a decision to apologize to the church and agree never to speak of the seven times again. One has passed to his rest. One has moved out of this area. And then my friend, the second, has moved away from this conference altogether. Now, some of this was noted in presentations that Elder Jeff gave in Newport in 2012. When my friend was cast out of the church, they had called for a meeting of all the church members, and he was not in the area at that time. He was in Alaska on a job site. The person that the conference chose to have as his surrogate was Steve Wolberg. So Steve Wahlberg stood up and did a good job as a hatchet man. So this person was adjudged as being unworthy to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So he's written these documents. When we go through some of the others, his website and all of the documents will be shown. The website name is Truth in Types, and his entire focus has been upon the Three Angels message and Leviticus 26. Now, do, are there any questions of what I've just stated? Is there anything I can help make clearer? Is that truthintypes.com? Yes. Okay. 
then his position on Leviticus 26 would be at what point of development or understanding? Would he accept the prophetic mirror? I would believe he would. But he wouldn't know about the four or seven times and their connection to the 2300 days with the periods of 70 years. That part, I don't know that I would have an answer. Given where he's currently living, it would be right now 530 in the morning for him. I can ask if he would be willing to come to a couple of meetings and see if he would be willing to answer other questions. Now, where we finished yesterday was in these last two paragraphs because we did not go into the conclusion. The kings of the south and the north operate within the confines of these three powers, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. In other words, the king of the south and the north are always defined by their relation to the larger entity. Up to verse 31, the king of the south and the north are defined by their relationship to paganism. And in verse 40, they're defined by their relationship to papalism and then to apostate Protestantism. This relationship is further defined by the distinction between paganism and papalism. The one deals with civil civil and secular, the other deals with moral and religious. This holds true with the kings of the south and the north in verse 40, as they draw their bearing from the papacy, always remembering that the papacy is a marriage of paganism and Christianity. In considering the role of the book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, it is not my intent to undermine or in any way to cast doubt or suspicion on the interpretive work of Elder Uriah Smith, as I believe his motives were honest. I am simply stating that I do not believe that he was given present truth for our time. But does this in any way negate his interpretive work concerning the seals or the trumpets or the churches? or the history he lays out concerning these time periods. For me it does not, for I have been blessed with a greater understanding of both Daniel and Revelation because of his work. It's a nice statement. Now, much of what Uriah Smith presented during his lifetime, and during that lifetime of Elder James White, my personal preference would be, to agree with James White more than I would agree with Uriah Smith. So that's just my statement. Yeah. So um, it doesn't really make sense as a a conclusion, but (laughs) right. uh, It's more as an aside um, or as a clarification of some other points, but above that, where he's talking about his interpretation of verse 40 and 31. So he's, he's, he's connecting the daily to that verse, he, that is, he's saying that in understanding the daily, that's how we understand verse 40. Right. And we never made that connection before. We've never made a connection between the king of the north and the king of the south, representing paganism and the papacy. Um, but he, he equates paganism with spiritualism. So, I mean, it, it does make some sense, but... Uh, I would need to know more about how he develops that idea. Okay. Because, you know, you've got the two desolating powers, and I, and I can't figure out how how that connects to then, let's say, uh, the 2520 particularly, unless you're saying that is there a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south in, you know, 508? You understand what I'm saying? I get it. So I'm not sure if he's really trying to, like, overstating really his argument. I mean, you can see some connection, but I I can't see it fully yet. Okay. Mrs. White, in letter 103 of 1904, tells us that the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Here, Mrs. White is making the statement. And it's one that we have all referred to. It's one that we have all agreed upon so do we have any portion of this that we might need to address or shall we just continue in telling us this she is letting us know that there was a portion of daniel 11 yet to be fulfilled and was still future to them at that time 
It is my belief that Uriah Smith was correct in his interpretations until he reached the point where he changed a word to fit his perspective based on the events of history as he understood them. In other words, he was trying to reconcile a present truth for our time to the parameters of the present truth for his time. It's a nice way of, of trying to say that Uriah Smith <clears throat> was correct, but not totally correct. Yeah, well, you know, and the idea there, I mean, that's true of all of us. Right. But it, you know, there's things that weren't understood in his day. Ellen White's not going to uh, dismiss everything he's doing just because there's some things that he hasn't fully understood yet. There probably was a purpose in him understanding things the way that he did, as far as, you know, bringing people into Adventism and so forth. So I don't think it's wrong, you know, completely wrong to look at what's happening around you and trying to to make sense out of things, right? If you think Christ is coming soon, it's natural to look at external events and see how they fit into Bible prophecy. Right. But we always have to be cautious in that way, which is what James White tries to say in that he believes that Uriah Smith was moving away from things that we understood to be true. His next statement, each person must come to his or her own conclusion as to how much of an endorsement is comprehended in Mrs. White's statements. I realize that there are many more arguments, both pro and con, that could be presented. It is interesting that Mrs. White is all but silent in regard to the actual interpretation of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. I believe that there is a reason for this silence and also for the dilemma concerning her endorsement. Here, he comes to quote Manuscript 59 of 1900 and early writings 74. John heard the mysteries which the seven thunders uttered, but was commanded not to write them. The special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and the second angel's messages. It was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested. In the order of God, most wonderful and advanced truths would be pro proclaimed. The first and second angel's messages were to be proclaimed, but no further light was to be revealed before these messages had done their specific work. Then, early writing 74, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures was as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. The 1843 chart was directed by the Lord, yet it contained a mistake in some of the figures, but the figures were as he wanted them. The mistake was not the Lord's mistake, but man's mistake. Yet the Lord left it there, for their faith must necessarily be tested. It was only understood correctly when his hand was removed. In principle, I believe that that would also apply to our dilemma with Uriah Smith's book. Would would we approach this in a different manner? I, I, I well, I think we would approach it different. Okay. Um, because. Because when you're dealing with God holding his hand over a mistake in some of the figures, I mean, that's sort of a prophetic event, right? Okay. You can't just say that, you know, every time something's not fully understood, God's holding his hand over it in that sense, right? I, I don't think it becomes, there's some test there. Okay. But that, there is, you know, idea that God doesn't always reveal everything all at once. That part you could probably but i just wouldn't equate it with that that uh with the 1843 chart in that way okay so maybe if he says in principle i don't know in principle i believe that would also apply i don't i don't think so i would use something more like you know that, that truth is unfolds there's always new light and that sometimes you know we we just get things wrong in our understanding because we're 
our perspective hasn't revealed the light on that path yet. Okay. So each generation is given present truth for their time, but not for future generations. Now, Luke 4, 17 to 20 very specifically applies to this principle. In reading this portion of scripture, going back to verse 16 and not just 17, <clears throat> we would find the following. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that were bruised, to preach the acceptable day of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down in the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on to him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, in this situation, in this portion of Isaiah, we have quite a bit that could further be said. But his point in this document is that He's saying that Christ revealed only what was necessary to the people at that time. Do we have any issue with that type of a statement? No, that's the way that I would understand. Okay. Are we all in agreement on that? Okay. In this passage, Christ opens the book, reveals to the people what is present truth for their time, <clears throat> and then closes the book and hands the closed book back to the minister. That group of people, the Jews in general, were unaware of the present truth to be given to the Protestant churches in the Millerite time frame. And in turn, the Millerites were not given the present truth for our generation. Each generation is given the present truth for their time, but the book then closes for them. As a logical segue, stating that this group of people we're unaware of the present truth given to the Protestants. That's that's an interesting application. I just, <clears throat> I find it to be a jump. In the following article, we are going to take a closer look at the role of France and atheism and their relation to the papacy. Atheism is a fascinating power when viewed from the larger scheme of the three great persecuting powers. The same principle that applies to atheism also applies to Islam and they both ascend from the bottomless pit. In Adventism, depending on which intervention or which interpretation is used, both atheism and Islam, along with Egypt, have been assigned as the king of the south. There is a common denominator between these three in that all three are represented as a satanic power. Understanding the role of each of these powers will help in turn, help us to understand whether any one of them have the capacity to be the king of the South. Yeah, so so this kind of leap. So one is we do know Islam is a satanic power. Right. But that doesn't mean that you can just equate atheism and Islam and that you could make Islam king of the South in in any way. But is that kind of what he's, he's saying, that, that in some position islam is the king of the south in some point i guess well he's just introducing the idea here i have a problem with the introduction of islam being the equivalent of atheism mm -hmm. i mean islam is a very specific specific role prophetically yes right now i mean the idea is that we have um you know, the fall of of uh, Eastern Rome is going to be done by Islam. The fall of Western Rome, we could say, is done by by what? What causes the fall of Western Rome? Well, it's the Germanic powers. Now, they're pagan, but you wouldn't say that paganism causes the fall of Western Rome. I don't know. There's, 
yeah, there's something wrong with it. But anyway. Okay. Now, as a question, I have now made copies of all of his articles, all 12 of what's currently on his website, going back through article number one through article 12. Do we want to continue and look at article 10 or do we go back to article 12 at this point or article one at this point? Excuse me. Well, I, I would go to article one myself, but okay. I mean, I have looked at it and. Okay. Give me just a moment. Not very long. It's just more almost an introduction to this. Okay. Any other comments about what we've seen here so far? Well, I have seen other people, you know, throw Islam in there as the king of the south and also as the king of the north, right? So you've got people wanting to put Islam into Daniel 11, verse 40. Right. But different arguments to do so, right? And, I mean, if, you, if you're going to use, like, Uriah Smith's idea that, you know, Turkey is the king of the north, then you're going to have Islam as the king of the north. His way of looking at putting Islam here, I don't know if I'd seen that view before and how he did that. But um, I, haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at different views on Islam as king of the south. I, I've seen a presentation on it once, but it was not the same sort of arguments he's using. Okay. Now, here is his first article. I'm bringing it up now so I can share it. Daniel 11, The Takedown of the USA and Adventism, Part 1, The Dilemma. The purpose of this series of articles is to identify the underlying reason or the operative principle driving the new issues that are currently confronting us as a nation and, and as a church. COVID-19, social justice, critical race theory, woke, LGBTQ+, women's ordination, same-sex marriage, global warming, evolution, liberal versus conservative, Democrats versus Republicans, and so on. Daniel 11, along with Revelation 13 and 17, help us to define the underlying cause that has produced these inevitable events. First, a word regarding the title of this series of articles. I do not believe in conspiracy theories or the use of eye-catching and sensational titles and headlines. I do believe, however, in calling something what it is, especially when that something directly affects my country and my church. In my personal quest to understand the meaning of words and the intent that they convey, I go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary to look them up. It is my understanding that Noah Webster produced that particular dictionary in order to guard the language of our U.S. Constitution. It is interesting to see that he often uses scripture to illustrate the meanings of a word. With such services as Wikipedia and others, our language is ever-changing where it no longer conveys the original intent of a word. More and more, we are, expected, we are exposed to seemingly new issues that are happening in our society and church, which requires some kind of a name. Most, if not all, of these issues are simply a new manifestation of an older original version. It seems that now we give them a more sophisticated name as the old ones no longer work due to being outdated or politically incorrect, even going so far sometimes as to label them as hate speech. Also, when we give them a new term or name, somehow it becomes worthy of our attention and study again. In other words, we change the name, hoping to change the perspective. Any comment? Well, well I have a comment. Um, okay, so I don't know. I mean, I haven't done a lot of research on Noah's Webster's Dictionary. I mean, the reason I use it is because it tells you about the use of the words at that time. Right. But dictionaries always reflect the use of language at the time that they produce language always changes. You, you can't, you can't fix a language. You can't keep it, you know, in one form. I mean, you know, 1828 dictionary 
the, the meanings of words. There's lots of new words that had come in at that time that you wouldn't have had when the King James was published, for instance, and words always have different connotations. So I wouldn't put the blame on, on that on Wikipedia or some kind of plan to destroy language, even though there, there, there always has been, you know, an attack to some degree on language. Language can control ideas. But I don't know. I think it's a bit overstated because it just doesn't really pan out historically. There's no, there's no particular new attack on language. But we do know that that's part of what happens. I mean, they, they control language. So, you know, you say things like, well, in Canada, we have these things called safe injection sites, which, you know, it, it's, it's just a common thing to call something that's not really safe, uh, safe so that people aren't worried about it. Right. You, right. you know what I'm saying? So, and I don't think using the 1828 dictionary, that you can force the meanings of words now back to that dictionary. What you need to understand is whenever a person was writing, how they used language. So if you're studying material from the 1800s, yeah, the Noah's Webster's dictionary is useful. And always we need to define terms if we're having a discussion, you know, to recognize that people may be using terms differently. But uh, I don't know what other people think about that. Well, one of the points in in looking and trying to study entomology, the study of words. Mm -hmm. Etymology? Did you say etymology? I think, I believe I said entomology, but... Yeah, I, that's the study of insects. Okay. Entomology. Anyway. All right. You're right. The situation is that words do have and have changed in use over the years. One of the words that we find in a few places in the King James is the word buckler, which was a type of leather protective device to go over the knuckles. Today, if you hear the word buckler, many people won't know what you're talking about. They'll just let the word pass. They're thinking that must be some, some way or some item that allows you to buckle an item. So we have words that have changed in use over the years and how we approach these words and how we use these words may or may not be the same as the word was in the time of the end. Yeah. And, you know, like, you know, a good example of a word that, that has been misused in scripture is, because we're dealing with language that we're translating into English, you know, be therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. Right. And some people point out, well, the word can be translated as mature, right? But the word mature has different shades of meaning, right? Correct. Right. So the word mature, when it's translated as mature, means perfect, right? That means complete, whole. So like as a seed that is mature, it is now perfect. It's perfectly formed. So, you know, so people play around with words all the time to try to either weaken statements of scripture or manipulate statements of scripture to fit in with their particular understanding. Um, I think what's important with language is always to understand what a person means and to clarify it. And so when people, you know, exchange one meaning of a word for another, that is they they make an argument with one meaning of the word and then they switch in another meaning of the word. That's just a common uh, logical fallacy. It's called equivocation. And, and people do it all the time. And, and I find it frustrating because, you know, I'm really interested in language and words and meaning and ideas. And, you know, we need to understand when we're using words what we mean by them. Sometimes we don't even know what we mean by the words we use. So it, it's just an important part of communication. And, and we shouldn't use words in a way. To... I like the one that Paul uses, uh, lettuce. Actually, it means to stop, isn't it? 
You know the one I'm referring to? Him and now lettuce. Him and now lettuce. The let hindereth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It means not to let, but to stop. Yeah, yeah. That word's changed meaning. Exact opposite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, awful yeah. also has changed meaning. Okay, setting the stage. To begin with, though, we'll be looking at the last portion of Daniel 11. We are going to do so with a different set of glasses. I have noticed, along with many others, that within Adventism, there are different schools of thought or camps, so to speak, when it comes to the study of Daniel 11, particularly from verse 36 on. The kings of the south and the north are highly debated and usually boils down to two or three accepted interpretations. Having said that, I would like to point out a principle that I believe is highly relevant to this study and to the debate as to who the king of the south and the king of the north represent. The principle is found in two other histories who also engage in a study of their present truth, as found in the book of Daniel. Both of these groups ran into interpretive trouble when studying their unfilled portion, unfulfilled portion of Daniel, just as we have. The first history has to do with the Jews in the time of Christ, and the second was with the Millerites. In both cases, their study of present truth came from the book of Daniel, and each was detailed a series of events leading to a movement of Christ. The present truth of the Jews was the 17th, 70th week of Daniel 9, and the present truth for the Millerites was the end of the 2300 years of Daniel 8. One involved a movement from the courtyard to the holy place, and the other a move from the holy place to the most holy place. The same is true of our time, with our present truth found in the last unfulfilled portion of Daniel 11, which leads directly to the final movement of Christ in chapter 12, 1. The principle is found in the book of the Great Controversy, in the chapter called Light Through Darkness, on pages 352 to 353, Mrs. White lets us know that as the principles were mistaken in regard to the kingdom to be set up at the end of the 70 weeks, their present truth from Daniel 9, so Adventists were mistaken in regard to the event to take place at the expiration of the 2300 days, their present truth from Daniel 8. Now, if we were to take this quote and this statement as fact, if we were to agree with it, how would we then choose to relate the events of July 18th of 2020? Okay, so what he is saying here is that there's a movement of Christ, that is, there's this work in the sanctuary that's going on, and that we have a disappointment in the time of the Millerites, and that's connected okay. with Daniel 9, and we have a disappointment in the time of the Millerites that's connected with Daniel 8. And if we, we look at the disappointment in our time, that would be connected with Daniel 11, if you would follow his logic, right? Okay. Not so much saying July 18th, because I don't think he's focusing on July 18th. But that's, he's that's how he's looking at it, right? He's looking at it um, probably in connection with uh, you know, what, and, and I'm not sure exactly where he, he, what, what he was thinking of at this point, as far as the disappointment in our time, but probably something to do with current events that, uh, maybe Trump or something like that. I just don't know his full understanding on these things. Now, so uh, we, we've, we've dealt with this idea before, which, which I think is a correct idea, just exactly you know, if we're going to if we're going to deal with this movement in July 18th, you know, what what verse, what uh, passage or chapter would be connected with the disappointment of July 18th? Now, I think July 18th is more a a type of something that's going to happen rather than the thing itself. So I think that would be because our line is typical. So. I don't know exactly how to answer that question in regard to July 18. Well, 
the reason I'm bringing this up is that I think we're all in agreement that July 18th was a disappointment. My personal take has been that the events of July 18th were, again, a parallel of the events of October 22nd, 1844. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just trying to connect these. So if you go to Daniel 9, you say, okay, Daniel 9, that's because of what we've understood. We're understanding that Daniel chapter 11 is addressing the the 2520 prophetic mirror right is is the understanding so so daniel has an understanding of uh the 70 weeks and the 2300 days at the beginning of his last vision he already understands those points right so he's going to be given an understanding of further of the kazon that that's how we understand it so is there if we were going to connect July 18th to, uh, I don't know how we would particularly do that. Well, in this, well, I, you know, I'm not going to argue his point in trying to state that this is present truth from Daniel 9 and Daniel 8. The point that I would, I would have addressed is the first of the disappointments more in relation to the first warning of Leviticus 26 and is the portion from October 22nd, 1844 in relation to the second warning of Leviticus 26. Okay. The first warning and the second warning, do you mean in like in Millerite history and our history? I'm well. I'm I'm speaking the Jews' history first, oh. Millerite history second, and our history being that of the third warning of Leviticus 26. Okay, so it's just all of Leviticus 26 has an application for the Jews, literal Jews. It had an application right. for the Jews, and it has an application for us, right? At, in in giving the warning. Now, the interpretation, of course, for uh, the literal Jews have to do with Babylon coming in and taking them captive. In Millerite history, it has to do with the end um, of the 2520. So it has to, because of the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, 70 weeks transferring it from literal to spiritual Israel, 2300 days extending uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary into Millerite history. Then in our history, how do we bring that third warning of Leviticus 26? How do we see that connection? What are the verses? Is it Daniel chapter 11? Is that, you know, particularly the last portion of verse 40 to 45? Is there some way that we connect that to Leviticus 26? Well, well, the next point that he's going to make, maybe read that and then we can discuss that because that will okay. help us. She then gives us the reason for the mistakes. In both cases, there was an acceptance of or rather than an adherence to popular errors that blinded the mind of the truth. Backing up a page, she also tells us that errors that had been long established in the church prevented them from arriving at a correct interpretation of an important point in the prophecy. He then gives definitions. Acceptance, a receiving with approbation or satisfaction, favorable reception, as a work done to acceptance. Adherence, the quality or state of sticking or adhering. Prevent, to hinder, to obstruct, to intercept the approach or the access of. When I consider the meaning of these words, I find the same thing also applies to me in how I understand our present truth in Daniel 11. Acceptance would imply that the disciples and the Millerites were satisfied with the prevailing interpretation of the truth for their time. But she then uses the word adherence, implying instead that they were either uncomfortable or unable to see outside of the popular and long-established errors held by the church. In other words, they were stuck in those established errors 
and those errors intercepted the approach of the correct meaning and denied its access. Yeah. So then we would see here, which which um, in, in applying this idea to our disappointment, we have a disappointment because of a lack of understanding that we have to go through that disappointment in order to receive or to clearly see that we have a lack of understanding. Right. Right. That that's how I understood what was happening within the movement. Now, the, the particular issue or the thing that we didn't understand, that's really what we have to examine. We have to know clearly what lessons we were supposed to learn. And, and there's a number of them, of course, that are all sort of connected. I mean, one is, you know, that we were, weren't ready for what we imagined we were ready for. That was, of course, part of it. But there is also other understandings of scripture that led us to that particular error. So there was there was lots of different errors that were happening. If you look at like November 9th, people believing that, you know, somehow they were going to magically not sin anymore. I mean, how people could draw that conclusion would only be because they didn't understand righteousness by faith. And. And Parminder had set up people in the movement, his group, the Omega group, to easily wander down that, that path. But, but even many people that weren't part of Parminder's group were in that direction, that, that sort of mindset about November 9th, right? So then when we have July 18th, what particular, what was the issue? Uh, is it related to the disappointment of November 9th, the misunderstanding? Is there something else? So we haven't really defined that, you know. So what, what he's setting up here is, is something that, you know, we, we really need to consider. What is it that we didn't understand? And, and it would be tied with a major issue, right? So it's, it's going to take lots of consideration, I think. All right. Now, when, when I'm looking at this, the premise that, that I'm presenting in relation to this article, if we were looking at the third of the warnings in Leviticus 26, we would start at Leviticus 26, 24, and it would be the verses that state, then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant when ye gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hands of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. So I'm, I'm trying to make sense of what he's presenting here. I'm just, I'm questioning because it's not resonating with what I what I've come to, to understand. Okay. Now you're looking at that third seven times. Correct. So are you trying to equate like the first seven times is connected to to the first warning, the second to the second warning, the third to the third warning? Yes. So then what's the fourth warning? The fourth warning if we've understood all this correctly, which would be the, the warning that we would find in Revelation 18, would be where God is saying to those true-hearted believers, come away, join with me. Yeah. So I, so I don't know if I would line those up in the way that you did there. All right. So we can take those four seven times, right? They And we can see that they have... Uh, four events that they mark in the progressive destruction of ancient Israel, right? So Manasseh's captivity, um, Daniel's captivity under Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin's captivity with Ezekiel being taken captive as well, and then uh, Zedekiah's captivity. Right? So those four events. Um, and we, we can see that we can put these into sort of a structure um, because we can – Equate all of the kingdoms, uh, you know, the breaking of the pride of the power aligns with Babylon, while beasts robbing you of your children, the second seven times 
we can see that there's there's things connected uh, there uh, that we could connect with Medo Persia. The third we can connect with Greece, and the fourth we can connect with Rome. Right. So there's other ways in which we can look at those four seven times. But if we're going to apply them to the warnings, that means there's four different warnings. In, in but I only see three. That makes sense, Dwight. It does. So in in examining this document, we've got to find for ourselves points that we can accept. I mean, where I'm where I'm having my headache is Daniel nine, Daniel eight being placed more as present truth for the past where I'm still seeing that it's present. Those are also present truth for us today. And I I see that Leviticus is much broader in scope in Leviticus 26 than what he's trying to approach here. That's, that's where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, now we, we we dealt with of course uh you know the the different visions uh because in in Daniel chapter 10 we have this understanding uh dealing with um what we got like the different touches like you have like the three touches which we can relate to the three angels messages and then we have you know in in and in Daniel chapter 10, we also have like the thing, the debar, the commandment, the matter, right? We have the mara, right? The 2300 days. And we have the kazon, but we also have the mara, right? We have this, this fourth, right? So we always seem to have the three plus one. And so could we argue that Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45, which was FFA's uh, verse, that there's a disappointment for FFA, but then there is a fourth, which would apply afterwards. All right. Does that make sense? So if you're going to take the fourth seven times as applying, you you understand what I'm saying? I do. So uh, that would fit in with what we've understood. That is, FFA had this role which um, was connected with, you know, Christ beginning his work, the judgment of the living uh, beginning at nine 11. And yet we can see that there, there was a disappointment with FFA and, and, and it had its, its steps just as the Millerites had, right? You had November 9th, you had July 18th, you had December 25th. So does that mean that we're in another warning that that's what we're beginning is this fourth warning. Okay. Does that make sense, Dwight? I'm not going to disagree. But that seems pretty major sort of way of looking at things. I mean, that's a, like a, a huge issue. But it, it sort of seems to be what happened. I mean, FFA, it's, let me use the word relevance, now is definitely waned. I mean, it's had its role historically, but we're not looking for light coming from FFA at the present time. No. Because it's clear that they they failed that test. Now, now we could also argue that that was um, like the first angel's message. And just like the Protestants were tested under the first angel, if we put this in a broader context, we can say that FFA, that that warning represented the first angel's message. So you end up with all these wheels within wheels. You end up with all these interlocking cogs or wheels of this bigger picture. That's that's quite an idea. Okay. Yeah, lots of implications. Now, the article continues. In the debate of Daniel 1140, there are three main camps within Adventism when it comes to the identity of the king of the north and the king of the south. Turkey and Egypt, the papacy and atheism, and the papacy and Islam. 
one prominent Adventist minister boils his version down to the king of the north and the king of the south, both being Satan, making each entity a direct representative of Satan. Taking that thought in a different direction will help us to see an obvious but overlooked point. That is, without exception, each of the accepted views within Adventism have attributed satanic characteristics to the king of the north and to the king of the south. How one arrives at that conclusion depends greatly upon the identity of the willful king of verse 36, the king that does according to his will. The key to correctly identifying this king and other components of this prophecy is to correctly identify the daily of Daniel 1131. As we will see, the nature of this king, whether it be good or evil, determines the nature of the king of the north and the king of the south, whether they in turn be good or evil. This same principle is to be seen in two opposing views of the daily, as one ascribes satanic attributes to this entity, while the other ascribes godly attributes. Here again, there seems to be three prevailing views concerning the king of verse 36 and the king of the north and the king of the south. One view says that the king of, the, of verse 36 is the same as the king of the north. Another that the king of the north and the king of the south are in a direct battle against each other and have no bearing to the king of verse 36. While yet another view says that the king of the north and the king of the south are united in battle against the king of verse 36. And then yet again, there are two accepted views of the identity of the king of verse 36 that come to us primarily from either James White, who saw that the, that king is the papacy, and Uriah Smith, who saw that king as France. Okay, so so he he talks about these interpretive camps, right? And and we considered some of this, but we haven't really considered the Islam idea too much, right? Right, correct. Um, so we mostly just looked at the at the difference between Uriah Smith and James White's view. Now, I don't quite fully get his idea, though, because again, he he sees that there's something about the two opposing views of the daily, right? So part of his perspective is addressing that the daily is connected with understanding the king of the north and the king itself. So it's not something that we particularly addressed, right? We haven't right. addressed that point. Now, obviously in verse 31, you, you have the change from the daily being taken away and the abomination of desolation being set up. Now, in his application here, then it seems that he's He's not explicitly stating it, but he must say that that occurs in other lines, right? He, he doesn't specifically say it, no. He doesn't address that. Yeah, but that must be what he's he's saying, right? That I don't know that he's recognizing it. Yeah, I, I, I don't think he is. I don't think he's got it quite sorted out in that respect. Now... Now, so there's still problems here. Um, it's going to take us a little while to kind of sort this out, exactly what he's thinking. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's really following the whole thing, because it is kind of hard, at least for me. So, But the idea here is that because of these different views on the daily, or different, and, and some of them even appear to be the same, but they're, they're interpreted differently in the context of Daniel 11, verse 40. Right. That's basically what he said, starting at verse 36, I guess. That's where the change happens now. So this idea of Islam coming in. So so the main thing is we got. See, we've always looked at Turkey and Egypt. That's Uriah Smith's view. Papacy and Islam. Or, or papacy and uh, atheism. Right. Uh, that is the king of the south being France. But we never looked at pace, papacy and Islam. And so. Again, he brings in this idea whether these are satanic powers. And then he has to do, he dealing with this idea of the daily. Well, if the daily is Christ's ministry, that's something good, right? But, right. but I don't understand how the nature of the king, whether it be good or evil, 
determines the nature of the king of the north and the king of the south, whether they turn to be good or evil. I don't see how there's any view of the daily that tries to say that any of these kings are good. Am I missing something? Well, I don't think that you're missing something. I think that the, the point in trying to start the understanding of the daily in Daniel 11 is bypassing the establishment of the daily in Daniel 8. Well, because he doesn't fully understand all the prophetic periods and how they're connected in the structures? Right. Okay. So he really needs a better understanding of Daniel 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Correct. Yeah. So in a sense, he has some of the same problems Uriah Smith had. Right. But he's he's drawing different conclusions. Hmm. Here's the... The, the so, so I think part of the problem, the thing, that, of course, that needs to be understood in our time, because we've, we've discussed this a lot, is that the understanding of all these prophetic periods, how they're connected together, that is the thing that this movement should have understood, but never did. Agreed. Right. And, and we had the opportunity to understand it, but there was not really the the interest or the will to, and, and it would be partly, I think, because of party spirit and who's advocating what, that, you know, we saw in the movement, from my perspective, lots of people vying for their points of view on different things, but not really willing to look at other people's material. That, that's what I saw in the movement. Well, the sort of competition. Amen. Yeah, amen to that. I saw it as well. Yeah, and, and I was always interested in understanding everything that everyone was saying because I knew that we didn't understand everything, right? So that we needed to be... Really, more. relief being expressed when we didn't have to study numbers anymore. So I mean, there was definitely opposition. And yeah. The vision, the vision was the problem. Yeah, and, and it's not just like like people weren't studying my material because many people weren't. But it's like we weren't willing to look at – everybody had their particular viewpoint, and and there wasn't this uh, cooperation of trying to, to understand things. And, and, and I saw that, like, especially in the Canadian-American group, uh, groups after, you know, July 18th, just nobody was really listening to anyone else. There wasn't uh, – I didn't see people's like the word the, I would use, Theodore, is humility. There was there wasn't any humility. Yeah. They well, weren't crushed. They weren't crushed by disappointment. They were I don't know. I don't know. Well, yeah. Because really, I mean, it was a humbling, right? But we should we should have, have had lights going humbling. on. Like we should have we should have been enlightened. Like we should have been able to by that experience to have our minds opened up and say, here's where we are wrong. And, and, and let's, let's look at this and, uh, and understand, like examine our, our, ourselves. But in, instead it was more trying to find blame 50, somewhere else. 50,000 to 50. Yeah. So it's, it's, and so light should have been going on. Now the, the only place where I saw, some light coming was with Colin and, and Odilio. They, they had this sort of insights. They were actually looking at trying to understand the disappointment. But that wasn't most of the people in the movement. And even then, there was lots of resistance. People put up with Colin, right? People weren't really fully embracing it. And Colin, I don't think, was really aware of that because people were scared to speak out. Right. People wanted to have like this this idea that we're all in agreement when we're not. Right. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't an open. Nobody felt safe to 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 share their opinion. Not nobody. Well, yeah. I'm some I'm, I'm somebody. <laughs> yeah, I know there's a few people here, but I'm saying most people anyway. Right. Most people weren't going to question things. It's like we just need to listen and 
and people were waiting for their opportunity. So what I saw in the discussions is nobody listening or very few people listening to each other and then people just stating what they believed. And but there was no real discussion about it. It's still it's still happening. It's like almost just waiting for their turn to say what they have to say. Yeah, it's it's poor listening skills, really. I shouldn't be thinking about what I'm going to say while I'm listening to what a, someone else is saying. So, you know, I mean, preoccupied with what I'm going to say. I just, well, that's we're, we're the, trying that's to learn. Sense I get. <laughs> right? Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but people often don't recognize that. Like, they think when somebody is, well, let's just use me as an example. If, if I'm a- asking Colin something, they think that I'm approaching that in an argumentative way because that's how they would do it, right? Where I'm just trying to understand something. So Colin, you know, had presented you know, on Daniel 11, verse 1, 1 to 3, right? And I'm having this, this question because I want to understand, but they didn't want the questions because they thought I was arguing. And, and, and that for me, it was a little bit frustrating because I'm I'm not arguing. <laughs> if if I'm trying to clarify what you're saying, if I'm trying to understand what you're saying, how is that arguing? You know, I definitely wasn't pushing any view at the time because I was just trying to understand what he was presenting there. But I think that, you know, it, it makes it hard to have a discussion when people are, you know, vying for their point of view or there's a party spirit going on or something like that. I find it's it's just that environment. People don't feel safe. They mm-hmm. feel that they will they will be attacked <clears throat> if they express a different opinion or, like you say, ask a question to clarify. <clears throat> it's like you're setting them up to make your point. Yeah. That's well, well, people, people felt that I was feel. attacked. Well, that's, right. yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, you're which, actually simply asking questions for clarification. It's like me and these studies in one. A little far behind or whatever, I don't understand something. I, I like to interrupt and just ask a question. And that's okay. I love this style of study. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Dwight, you got anything to say on that? Well, from what I was hearing in this, we we have an obligation not to rely upon other men or scholars for our interpretation of how the Bible reads. The presentation that he's attempting to give here in stating these represent the prevailing camps in Adventism and are derived from the use of different methods of interpretation. The method one uses will determine the conclusion that is reached. Each of these conclusions have the official sanction of the BRI and our scholars. In other words, At the highest level in Adventism, they do not know. In addition to these three established views, there are multiple independent versions circulating around as well. What comes to my mind is the winds of the doctrines. Mm -hmm. And the winds are blowing various ways. Yeah. But, But I don't always think that it's just because there's different methods of interpretation, right? Like, I, I don't really believe that you know, having the right uh, hermeneutic is going to always lead you to the truth, right? Because it's it's more a personal walk, right? People can have lots of wrong ideas. Sure. They may not know exactly how to step, but God can lead them into truth, right? Right. And people can have the right methodology, so to speak. And because of their own personal attitude, they can go into darkness, Right. So it's not about. I mean, I understand there's an importance of understanding Miller's rules, but the most important rule is the last one. Okay. Without that, all the other rules don't matter. Right. You you will be led astray. So people people put a lot of emphasis upon, you know, the proper way of interpreting the methods of interpretation. But it's really has to do with the personal experience that 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 individual has in how open are they to truth and, you know, do they trust God's word? 
do they trust the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can lead them into truth? Are they willing to be corrected? Those are the most important aspects of biblical interpretation. You know, Miller's rules, they're fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But if Miller had not been open to God's leading, he would not have been the man that he was, right? Even if he had professed to follow those rules, he had to, at some point, a cross was presented to him, right? And so we knew that he came to that understanding in 1818, right? That's when he understood 25 years, Christ is going to come back, okay? But that wouldn't have meant anything if he hadn't heeded the call uh, to present his views at church in 1831, right? Okay. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have been a leader of, of the movement, right? So, so there, there came in his, his experience the point where he then fulfilled his purpose. And so it's not just a correct understanding of some scriptures that matter, right? You know, let's say we, you know, as a group, you know, we get together and we study and we have a correct understanding of scripture, but we don't do anything with it. Well, would it even matter? Okay. Yeah, it just, it just wouldn't, right? Okay. Now, we are coming toward the end of our time here together today. There is a comment in the chat, and I'm having to assume that this is a quote. Yeah, where's the quote? I'm trying to find that. The manuscript 10, 1888, remarks by Mrs. E.G. White on missionary work from the 1888 sermons by Ellen G. White. It's a compilation of her manuscripts and letters. So that particular one, it didn't copy and paste. Uh, 5 LT manuscript, manuscript 10, 1888. Called remarks by on G, by E. G. White on missionary work, Minneapolis, Minnesota, October twenty three, eighteen eighty eight. Okay. No, no. Sorry, guys. Actually, morning talk by Ellen G. White, Minneapolis, Minnesota, October twenty four, eighteen eighty eight. Manuscript nine, eighteen eighty eight. Okay, so this is yeah, that's manuscript nine, eighteen eighty eight, paragraph eight. Yeah, yeah, and is it you're saying it's October twenty fourth, the morning talk? Uh, yes, October twenty fourth, eighteen eighty eight. I actually presented this back in June. Yeah, so this is uh, the biblical date is uh, the eighteenth of July. Well, the eighteenth day of the seventh month. Right. Tishrei. Tishrei. Yeah, that's right. Um, but it's a symbol of July 18. Anyway. Okay. So, are there any other comments or questions that we need to address at this point? Well, just in, in this quote, which because we didn't read it, but okay. Ellen White says, I want to tell you what, what a good brother said to me as he was about to leave the meeting. He came to me with such a feeling of relief that everything was settled and our old position was all right. Well, one says, your prayers and your talk run in the channel of Dr. Wagner. I want to tell you, my brethren, that I have not taken any position. I have had no talk with the doctor, nor with anyone on this subject, and am not prepared to take a position yet. By their fruit, she shall know them. I took my brethren and told them just where they were, but they did not believe me. They did not believe they were in any danger. If Elder Wagner's views were wrong, what business is anyone to get up and say what they did here yesterday? Right. So basically, she's addressing the idea that people are just wanting to stick to their position. It, it's 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 the wrong type of spirit. Right. That's why Kelly shared, shared this. And uh, the paragraph 11, let us come to God as reasonable beings to know for ourselves what is truth. But if you want to take the position that only one man can explain the truth, I want to tell you that this is not as God would have it. Mm -hmm. but, right. and, and, and the important thing there, right, because often we look to one person, 
And, and that's, that's such a danger because truth comes, and that, that was the thing I liked about the movement, how Jeff was operating in the past, was he was willing to receive light wherever it came from. And then later he renounced that and said that that was a mistake. Yet, if, uh, and I'm, I'm taking this, but looking at, at part of this document even further, paragraph seven states it this way. I am full of pain as I view these things. And how can I help it? Do you think that when I see these things transpiring that I can keep still and say nothing when these things have been shown me? I want to tell you, my brethren, that it is not right to fasten ourselves upon the idea of any one man. So there's a lot of truth in this passage and in what she has written here on the 18th day of the seventh month, biblically, of 1888. I like her, in the, the line in the last paragraph, paragraph 18, I don't expect my testimony is pleasing, yet I shall bear it in God's fear. God knows there is a preparation going on here to fit these ministers to work, and unless we are converted, God does not want us. These truths will stand as long as time shall last. Yeah, it's it's interesting because as she as she stated in that paragraph, I hope Brother Morrison will be converted and will handle the Word of God with meekness and the Spirit of God. These Quite truths, interesting. So July 18. Yeah. Yep, these truths will stand just as long as time shall last. You want the eye salve that you can see, and Jesus will help you if you will come to Him as little children. May God help us to seek Him with all our hearts. Now, isn't that what what our expressed desire has been these last many months since July 18th of 2020? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comment or any other thought? Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for showing us where we are standing at this time. We thank you for the words of admonition from Sister White. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction as we go through this day. Help us to consider carefully that which we need to understand. Be with us now. Direct us in all things. Help us so that we might rely totally upon you and not upon the words of any one man. I ask your blessing upon those that have attended today and those that will view this study later. For this, we thank you and for this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.